Where do we find people like this? God. Only in America could you find such a man as Major General Victor Hugo. Vic was one of those larger than life characters. Like General Donovan, he was willing to try anything and everything to accomplish the mission. He grew up in a town he was fond of saying was named after him, Marblehead, Massachusetts. General Hugo graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York in 1954, where he lettered in lacrosse and hockey. He was captain of its hockey team during his senior year and was selected as an All-East and All-American honorable mention. He was asked to try out for the U.S. Olympic hockey team. I was a classmate of his in the class of 1954 at the United States Military Academy, West Point. I first met him when I saw him play hockey. Completing his basic officer schooling, parachute and ranger training in 1955, the general was assigned to the Central Intelligence Agency as a case officer for unconventional warfare and paramilitary action. He spoke French fluently. As a result of that, he was sent to Vietnam. And this was in 1955, which was very unusual. He was sent in a very small group working for the CIA. In Saigon, he was a principal member of Freedom Company, which assisted in training Asian nationals in counterinsurgency and other operations. In those days, Saigon was still Indochina. He worked in the Saigon military mission, directly under the OSS and CIA legend, Colonel Edward Lansdale, and Lansdale mentored him. He's patient. He looks for the opening, he's looking for what needs to be done, not necessarily what's directed, and he always worked so it was a win-win operation for everybody. Vic got to see close up how to win hearts and minds and deal with revolutions by countering revolution in a very interesting and innovative way. In 1956, he was posted to the 3rd U.S. Infantry, the Old Guard, at Fort Myer, Virginia where he wrote the plan for the interment ceremony of the unknown soldiers from World War II and Korea. In 1962, he was assigned to 1st Special Forces Group Airborne in Okinawa until 1965, where he planned and implemented a mandatory area study program for teams deploying to Vietnam. And then he developed an attack assessment matrix. So team leader could look at indicators in his area to see whether he might or might not be attacked by the Viet Cong. Both of those were very effective. In 1965, he conducted a special mission to rescue the Royal Lao Military Region 2 Commander, Major General Kam Kong Budavong, and keep him safe during four weeks of diplomatic discussions. Major Hugo went in with two or three guys and broke Major General Kong Van Budavang out of jail. It was pretty kind of cool, I thought. In 1971, he did his second posting to the Pentagon, where he was instrumental in establishing the U.S. Army Sergeant's Major Academy. They were trying to figure out ways to improve the leadership system in the Army. This developed a leadership and mentorship system for sergeant majors. It's become very good in the professionalization of the United States Army. From 1974 to 1979, he was the deputy director of the Army staff and the principal contact for Brigadier General Robert Kingston for Special Forces matters, including the establishment of Delta Force. In successfully establishing Delta Force, he needed to use all the lessons he learned from Colonel Edward Lansdale to negotiate a delicate situation. When they developed the Delta Force, there was a lot of horse trading done on the Army staff to set this up. Not everybody on the Army staff was privy to it because it was not a recognized organization. He was unusual. He wasn't just a special ops guy. He was an infantryman. 
He spent a lot of time on the Army staff, the Department of Defense staff, and he was also an air defender, and he commanded two of the largest air defense groups. From 1979 to 1981, General Hugo was the commanding general, 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade, Osan Air Force Base in the Republic of Korea and the U.S. ROK focal point for all surface-to-air air defense systems. He planned and implemented President Carter's decision to transfer air defense of the Korean Peninsula to the ROK forces and deactivated his brigade in June 1981. In 1982, General Hugo was promoted to Major General. General Hugo's final military assignment was as Commanding General, 32nd Army Air Defense Command, Darmstadt, Germany, from 1983 until his retirement in 1987. Responsible for providing combat-ready forces to the NATO Integrated Air Defense System, he developed and implemented the most far-reaching force modernization program for updating or replacing all NATO and the U.S. Army weapon systems organizations, training, logistical support, and doctrine. 32nd Air Defense Command was the NATO shield. So he did a lot of integration with German and Belgian and French and Dutch air defense units. They really reestablished NATO doctrine for air defense and upgraded everything. After retiring from the military, General Hugo had a long and successful post-Army career. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, General Hugo put his special operations experience to good use. Without funding and under his own initiative, he deployed to the Kuwait border with the Saudi Arabian Brigade. He did a super job working with the Saudi Arabian National Guard and the other Saudi Arabians and he also did some special forces work on the side. He moved with the Saudi Arabian National Guard Brigade down to the border with Kuwait and started taking pictures and interviewing refugees coming across the border. Got a real good idea of what the battle layout was of the Iraqi army. At the start of Desert Shield and Desert Storm, he provided all of that information as intelligence, and that's the only on-the-ground intelligence that we had going into the first Gulf War. He'd even roughed out what the order of battle was of Saddam's army. Vic was a leader in Saudi Arabia with Vanel Corporation and working with the Saudi Arabian National Guard, the Sang, which was the key fighting element on the part of the Saudis in the first Gulf War. It was the Sang under Vic's leadership that helped to drive Saddam's forces out of Kuwait. For all his success, General Hugo never lost focus on what the fight is really about, protecting our country, loved ones, and our way of life. After the tragic loss of his first wife, General Hugo once again found true love. He showed me a picture of him and Aunt Tui being married and being blessed by the Pope in Rome. Being in that household, you can feel that love that they have for each other. It was just contagious. They were inseparable. They were like a pair of chopsticks. You couldn't use one without the other. <laughs> General Hugo kept a busy schedule, but always had time to volunteer, to help out a family member or a fellow veteran. It was a tough transition for me to transition from the Marine Corps to the civilian side. He brought me into his home. He made sure that I was good to go and I had a good transition back to civilian life. He's there just reaching out to everyone. It doesn't matter what your rank is. He's going to reach out to you. He did that with all veterans. It wasn't just volunteering as a coach for hockey. It was tutoring individuals, teaching English as a second language. That's just the kind of man he was. General Hugo put his considerable charm and power of persuasion to good use by helping the OSS Society convince Congress to award OSS a Congressional Gold Medal 
its highest civilian honor. He used his political savvy on Congress to help get the OSS gold medal in 2018. They worked on that for about three or four years. If he hadn't have been up there lobbying and talking to people, I don't think they would have got it. God grant that men of principle be our principal men. General Hugo has been one of the OSS Society's greatest champions. He served as the Master of Ceremonies at its William J. Donovan Award Dinner for many years, commanding the room with his charm, presence, and trademark humor. Nothing improves a soldier's morale so much as when he knows his general has been shot. <laughs> a lot of truth in that comment. In addition to the Donovan Award Dinner, one of his great passions was planning the OSS Society's National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations that will honor Americans who have served at the tip of the spear as our nation's first line of defense. The OSS Society is dedicated to seeing his vision become a reality, and we can think of no greater tribute to General Hugo than to bring his dream to life. He was a driving force along with Mr. Charles Pink, president of the society, in formulating all of the plans necessary to bring about the successful conclusion of the construction of this National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. He made sure that every moment of his life was about living. And that's why he got up so early. He started his day with a three mile walk. He was gregarious, funny, a treat to be around. Anything he did, he was very determined to do and to do it very efficiently. He took everything seriously, but he had a great sense of humor. Whenever I think of Major General Victor Hugo, I will always remember a humble, quiet hero among us. A remarkable soldier. He earned the Distinguished Service Medal. He earned the Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Legion of Merit and the Vietnam Medal with six campaign stars. He was really a Special Forces icon, airborne ranger all the way, and a remarkable soldier, a great American, and it was a blessing to know Major General Victor Hugo. He's a man I'll never forget. When I think of Vic, I think right away of the man who is the patriot. Duty, honor, country, I don't think I can think of anybody else that's done as much to perpetuate the legacy of the OSS. He's kept the flame burning. General Hugo had been working tirelessly for several years to have a memorial to the OSS's fallen installed at Arlington National Cemetery. It was approved shortly after his passing his last successful mission.